Hey guys, Budcat7 here. Okay, it is Thursday, December 16th, 2021, and I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. All right, guys, well, in this video, I'd like to continue with my Legends of Giants series from around the world. And in this video, we are going to take a look at a legend of giants and perhaps somebody who was a giant himself sort of pitted against the giants. And what's so interesting about this particular legend here from Africa, it's sort of a combination of the sort of legends we've heard about so far, and there are many places we've gone so far, we heard about the legends of the giants, and it's like a mixed bag where you have these legends of good giants, you know, bringing sort of skills and technology, engineering, metallurgy, agriculture, etc., and teaching the sort of, you know, native population, wherever that maybe about you know these skills these important skills and they seem to be benevolent and kind and you know interested <laughs> in many of the cases so you know this is my evidence here on a channel against the whole cannibalism thing or whatever but that's the second part of the story was these other tales of the giants where they are hostile and cannibals and everything else so Again, you know, it's, it's more proof of the good giants and no proof of the cannibalistic giants other than these tales, which, again, it's just the demonization of the enemy when it's convenient, you know, when it's necessary and convenient to do. There's no truth in these things, and even less so with the giants because all the facts don't bear that out at all, you know, so quite something contrary, but uh, in any case, um, this legend from Africa interests me in the symbology in it, and, you know, symbolism here is very important to its understanding, because I can tell you right now, the mainstream who interpret this story, you know, it's legend, have no clue as to what it's about, because they don't know what we know, or at least, you know, agree to what we think the past is about here on this channel, with the large humanoids and large hominids of the past, and other hominid species, small or tall, doesn't really matter, you know, the, this is one of the profile points of the giants, and, and could be said with all these other strange humanoids from the past that seem to be combinations and you know what we would consider hybrids okay so in any case this this sim symbolism in the story is what's most important to me and what it's really telling us okay now let's take a look at symbol symbolism in a moment just some quick look at some facts here but I'd like to take a look at some of the um, archaeological ruins in Zimbabwe, which is where this legend comes from, of uh, Makoma. And what's there, what we know about there, I just briefly want to look at this and say a couple of things, because it's important, I think, and I think you ought to see what's here. But you probably ran across this if you've been doing this sort of thing for a while on the internet, you probably come across this thing in Zimbabwe here, what they call Great Zimbabwe, which is this sort of granite block stone construction, quite impressive one, if you've never seen it before. Here's some of the towers, or the tower um, associated with it. And, and also what's said about this place here um, it's important to know because it's related to so many other things we've looked at with the uh, Dean and Hopewell, the way some of these earthworks are built and what their purposes are for, etc., etc. Just more 
affirmations to what I believe these things are and seems to be from the research done on this channel that, you know, we're fairly competent in knowing what these things and the purposes of these things were. But let me just look at this a little bit. And I apologize again. I, you know, I've had this cold for weeks and weeks. It's probably the thing there. And I've got one of these variants and whatever. But, you know, some people who have gotten the jab a dab a do there are getting it as well. So it doesn't even matter if you're inoculated or not. But in any case, um, Let's take a look at this thing here for just briefly. I just want to go over a few things about this great Zimbabwe, this ancient construction here, which apparently it was abandoned in the 15th century, but and when they look at it a little bit more closely, it seems to be coming up with this date of 1300. And here they mention it here. Construction of the stone building started in the 11th century and continued for over 300 years. The ruins at Great Zimbabwe are some of the oldest and largest structures located in South Southern Africa and are the second oldest after nearby Mapungumbwe in South Africa. Its most formidable edifice, commonly referred to as the Great Enclosure, has walls as high as 11 meters. So that's 36 feet. That's awfully tall. And it seems to be all of this cut stone granite block, which seems to be, you know, handleable by people our size, you know, people of average size. Doesn't have anything to do with the giants per se, but what's interesting about this, you'll see in a minute, is there's something there that's awfully suspicious to me anyway. David Beach believes that the city and its state, the kingdom of Zimbabwe, flourished, flourished from 1200 to 1500, although a somewhat earlier date for his demise is implied by a description transmitted in the early 1500s to Joao jo de Barros, Joao de Barros. Its growth has been linked to the decline of the Mpungubwe, from around 1300 due to climatic change or the greater availability of gold in the hinterland of Great Zimbabwe. Well, it's interesting that they say this because this 1300 date, okay, lots of things were happening have gone over on this channel too, including a, a massive volcanic eruption that occurred around that time, okay, where all these sort of civilizations abruptly ended at that time all around the planet so there's something else is going on it seems most likely that what they're saying here about it ending in 1300 seems most likely the true date because we know about this it's already well known about this cataclysm whatever happened around that time that just put an end to many civilizations around the whole planet so the date keeps coming up and up again so it's hardly surprising here once you know about the rest of the research. Um, it says it takes, there are three architectural groups of the buildings, you know, types of buildings there and types of enclosure, okay? And just take a look at this picture here. These the ruins are built around these things here. Now, there's a guy here sitting at the top of this, Massive cyclopean block. Now, it, if this doesn't look like some sort of gigantic Neolithic construction with perched stones and wedge stones holding this thing up, here's the fella up here. Here's the type of construction stone used in the construction of this thing. See, relative to his size, here, it's all sized up or somebody of average size to be able to handle these stones so not probably not built necessarily by giants but maybe the hybrids okay which somewhat has to do with the legend there too but doesn't this seem awfully suspicious to you i mean according to them here this is the sort of bird stone that's the symbol of zimbabwe this bird stone here, but these look like cyclopean blocks 
sort of, you know, stacked there to me. I don't know, but that's what it looks like to me, folks. So, I mean, are they building on a site from a Cyclopean past? And do the roots go back that far? Well, maybe. <laughs> that looks awful suspicious to me there, but. The thing is a circular construction. It seems to be medium security to me, and that all suggests to me when I go down to this part of our trade here. Archaeological evidence suggests that the Great Zimbabwe became a center for trading with artifacts, suggesting that the city formed part of a trade network linked to Kilwa and extending as far as China. Copper coins found at Kilwa Kiswani appear to be the same pure ore found on the Swahili coast. I wonder if that came from uh, the Michigan Peninsula there. This international trade was mainly in gold and ivory. Some estimates indicate that more than 20 million ounces of gold were extracted from the ground. That international commerce was in addition to the local agricultural trade in which cattle were especially important. The large cattle herd that supplied the city moved seasonally and was managed by the court. Chinese pottery shards, coins from Arabia, glass beads, and other non-local items have been excavated at Zimbabwe despite these strong international trade links. There is no evidence to suggest exchange of architectural concepts between Great Zimbabwe and centers such as Kilwa. Okay, so there's a lot of political wranglings about this site here and controversy, so it's noteworthy to think about that because you have problems here, big problems here, and it has a lot to do with, like here in the United States, with the indigenous peoples and the history there and how it's supposed to go according to mainstream, et cetera, et cetera, where, you know, here on this channel, we're dealing with a completely different view of the past. And, you know, no indigenous peoples anywhere should be offended at all, whatever. It's just they should know about the past, too. It's totally different than they are given by mainstream because they're given their history by mainstream a lot of times. Okay, they go to... You know, main, the you know, native peoples go to mainstream university to learn about these things, and they're indoctrinated by mainstream university as well. Okay, so there's a lot of controversy about these things everywhere. I do. The controversy in the Americas is if there's any evidence of any sort of white people being in the Americas prior to the native peoples, well, that's a problem, and they don't want to admit to that or anything, and hence the people who talk about the Vikings and blah, 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 blah. But again, I don't think that because of what we know about John Jensen's work in the ancient canals, the stuff I covered in my previous video, okay, there's just a whole bunch of people living here in the Americas. I doubt anybody was colonizing anywhere. There were millions of people, but you might set up a trading post. It's very common. They talk about trading posts, the Arabic trading posts here in Africa, on the um, African coast, okay, so it's, there's no surprise there. This is what we do today. This is what the trading zones are everywhere throughout the world. In every country, there are trading zones where literally those trading zones are the, you know, the ground, uh, the, the country that they, you know, are walking on. They are their own country where, you know, regular citizens are not allowed into these trade zones. But all sorts of commerce happens in these trade zones. We still have them today, you know. All these things were done for security purposes. You have to secure trade. Any sort of trade has to be secure. If there's no guarantee and no security in the trade, well, there's no trade. Okay, it's as simple as that. Okay, so it's interesting what they say about it being a trading zone, a circular structure with these sort of medium security. You can see the openings and have stairways that go up. You can be defended, okay, but not like high security where it's impossible to get in unless you have scaling equipment and battering ramps and all this kind of other stuff. But it's not like a castle. It's you know, it's a different kind of setup, and it you know, has a lot to do with trade. They talk long about trade and trade and trade, and there's no disagreement on that. But it's interesting. This Carl Mouse guy sort of like screwed it up for everybody with his whole you know sort of uh, racist view that they take 
because it didn't make sense. These constructions didn't make sense, and they were similar to so many other constructions. In fact, they're similar to constructions here in, in the Americas at Holbin Weep, Salmon Ruins, and at Galena Canyon. They're very similar to those constructions, okay, in their level of um, engineering, etc. But this Theodore Bent guy wrote a book about it, and just listen to what he has to say here about it. Okay. Ben had no formal archaeological training, but had traveled very widely in Arabia, Greece, and Asia Minor. He was aided by the expert cartographer and surveyor Robert M. W. Swan, who also visited and surveyed a host of related stone ruins nearby. Ben stated in the first edition of his book, The Ruined Cities of Mashonaland, that the ruins revealed either the Phoenicians or the Arabs as builders, and he favored the possibility of great antiquity for the fortress. By the third edition of his book, he was more specific, with his primary theory being a Semitic race of Arabian origin of strongly commercial traders living within a client African city. Okay, so this is what this fellow thought it might be going on there in the past and certainly could be but because of political reasons you can't say any things and here it says the lemba the construction of the great zimbabwe is also claimed by the lemba members of this ethnic group speak the bantu languages spoken by their geographic neighbors and resemble them physically but they have some religious practices and beliefs similar to those in judaism and islam which they claim were tr transmitted by oral tradition they have a tradition of ancient jewish or south South Arabian descent through their male line. Genetic Y-DNA analysis in the 2000s have established a partially Middle Eastern origin for a portion of the male limba population. More recent research argues that DNA studies do not support claims for specifically Jewish genetic heritage. Okay, but their Middle Eastern origin DNA, and well, where did that come from? Okay, so maybe this guy was onto something, this, uh, Bent guy, this Theodore J. Theodore Bent guy. Maybe he's onto something there, and this has something to do with it, but it's just an uncanny coincidence that these people have uh, Middle Eastern DNA in them. Okay, so let's just take a look down here. It talks about damage to the ruins, and you know, a lot of the supposed researchers there damaged all these things and looters and all that kind of stuff at the political implications okay so this is from the other side this is from the ruling class there in Rhodesia at the time and Zimbabwe there was all ruled by Europeans okay so listen this archaeologist Paul Sinclair says i was the archaeologist station at great zimbabwe i was told by the then director of the museums and monuments organization to be extremely careful about talking to the press about the origins of the great zimbabwe state i was told that the museum service was in a difficult situation that the government was pressuring them to withhold the correct information censorship of guidebooks museum displays school textbooks radio programs newspapers and films was a daily occurrence once a member of the museum board of trustees threatened me with losing my job if I said publicly that blacks had built Zimbabwe. He said it was okay to say that yellow people had built it, but I wasn't allowed to mention radiocarbon dates. It was the first time since Germany in the 30s that archaeology has been so directly censored. Okay, so there you have it, okay, how it goes in some cases, and in this case, okay, where, you know, you have this heavily censored information about this because of political reasons etc cetera, etc cetera. and now that you know it goes around it turns around it's now in the other hands of the indigenous people or whatever it is now you're going to see it to the other extreme see the pendulum swings both ways when it's on the right or the left up at that position over there it's, it's not safe it's never safe it's only safe when it's not moving okay back and forth and back and forth like that Okay, it's a stationary position. That's when it's stay safe. All right, so 
I just thought I'd mention all these things about the great Zimbabwe here, okay, and about this circular structure with the medium security that seems to be all about trading, okay? It's all about trade, okay? And who's to say who built it, what civilization, if it's around this 1300 date, something could catastrophic happen back then, and who knows who is where. Okay, and it seems like all these other civilizations stumbled upon these, you know, ruins after that time and rewrote history in accordance to the way they saw fit afterwards. Another one of these historical resettings going on, probably was many of them, it's not just one historical reset going on in the past, there's many of them, you know, and who's doing that, you know. The non-human entities from a different dimension, not aliens from outer space, but something that comes through the cracks there. Who knows? Evil that comes through these cracks in space. All right, so let's take a look at this mythology of the Macoma here. Macoma, this figure, and the symbology involved in that. And just to talk about symbolism for a second here. Okay, so we all know the symbolism, I think. When we talk about the Last Supper, when we, you know, this is, you know, frequently redone in the church, okay, when you receive the sacraments, when you drink the blood of Christ and you eat the bread of Christ, okay, so this is not what you're doing. You're not taking a bite out of Christ's arm and he's giving you sustenance that way because, you know, you, now you got a meal for the day and you got something to drink, some wine, his blood, or whatever it is. It's all symbolic, okay? Many symbolic things sort of suggest what it really is, okay? So when you're eating the bread, bread is also a gift from God, okay? When Jesus multiplied the bread to feed the crowd, bread became a sign of sharing. It also symbolized the word of God which nourishes the crowd. So when you eat the bread there, when you're eating of Christ there, you're you're eating of of his teachings that you're consuming his teachings is what you are you're consuming his spirit in the blood okay it's just symbolic blood globally represents life itself okay so you're consuming the gift of life through christ and that's what it's you're consuming you're not drinking his blood for real or whatever it is it's there's nothing to do with it. It's just symbolic where you're consuming his teachings and his way and his spirit. You see, it's just as simple as that. So that's what the meaning of that is. Anybody who thought otherwise is thinking like a child, okay? That's what symbology is all about. What does it really mean? And here we have symbology as well. And if you've been following along on this channel, you're going to know exactly what it means. It's so clear to me. Okay, so anybody else who's been following one of the channels is an expert in the giant humanoids of the vast and the past in general, seen in a different way. Okay, uh, but we have a better understanding of it here, and you'll see why with the stories that are, are done through the legends of the giants. So, Makoma is this legend of this person, Makoma. This story is from the Sena people of Zimbabwe and begins on the banks of the Zambezi River, one of the longest rivers in Africa. You can read more about the Zambezi at Wikipedia. Oh, boy, the baloney online encyclopedia. Yay. You have to include that because this is a UNESCO, a UN retelling of this story. Or whatever. I don't care who it is. We're going to break it down to see what it really means. But it's from an old book, which is very interesting. The illustrations are really nice. Story part is part of the African Stories Lang Unit. Story source, the Orange Fairy book by Ang Andrew Lang and illustrated by H.J. Ford, 1906. There's a beautiful where McCormick's going into the alligator, you know, he's going to go tear the alligators apart and smash them up with his iron hammer. McCormick leaps into the pool of crocodiles. And so I guess it's on LibriVox audio. I love it when the British girl reads it the best. Once upon a time, at the town of Senna, on the banks of the Zambezi, was born a child. He was not like other children, for he was very tall and strong. Over his shoulder, he carried a big sack, and in his hand, an iron hammer. So, is it an iron hammer from the Iron Age, or is this the iron from the ancient times, including during the Egyptian pharaohs, okay, where people like King 
Tutankhamen had, you know, as a headrest, a uh, meteoritic iron headrest, and he also had a dagger made out of meteoritic iron as well. So maybe Makoma has a meteoritic uh, iron hammer with him from a much older time frame than even they think. He could also speak like a grown man, but usually he was very silent. One day his mother said to him, My child, by what name shall we know you? And he answered, answered Call all the head men of Senna here to the river's bank. And his mother called the head men of the town. And when they had come, he led them down to a deep black pool in the river where all the fierce crocodiles lived. Oh, great men, he said, while they all listened, which of you will leap into the pool and overcome the crocodiles but no one would come forward so he turned and sprang into the water and disappeared the people held their breath for they thought surely the boy is bewitched and throws away his life for the crocodiles will eat him then suddenly the ground trembled and the pool heaving and swirling became red with blood and pres presently the boy rising to the surface swam on shore but he was no longer just a boy he was stronger than any man and very tall and handsome, so that the people shouted with gladness when they saw him. Hmm, they see one of these hybrids. Okay, was there a possibility of time in the past where the real giants were around, hybrids were around, average sized people were around, other weird people were around, all different kinds of people were around? Sure. We know it. Because we know from the research of the channel, all different kinds of humanoids existed in the past and apparently all crossbred with each other probably at a time long after a time when there was all sorts of genetic engineering going on and we know that because of corn there's no doubt in anybody's mind it could, can't be any other thing okay corn was not created by cavemen okay by some society at least as advanced as ours if not more and had completely different technology based on the same stuff that's all This is what we did. They did something else. Because there's, you know, all these different ways that you do things. Because there's more than one way to skin a cat. An expression which I hate. Then he said to his mother, rest gently, my mother, for I go to make a home for myself. Oh, no, no, I got to say, now, oh, my people, you cry with his hand, you know my name, I am Macoma, the greater, quote, unquote, for have I not slain the crocodiles into the pool where none would venture? Then he said to his mother, rest gently, my mother, for I go to make a home for myself and become a hero. Then entering his hut, he took, out, took Nuendo, his iron hammer, and throwing the sack over his shoulder, he went away. Macomb crossed the Zambezi, and for many moons he wandered towards the north and west until he came to a very hilly country where one day he met a huge giant making mountains. Hmm. A giant making mountains. I wonder what kind of mountains the giant was making. Was he making mounds that were mountains? Hmm, I bet he was. Greetings, shouted Macoma. You, you, who are you? I am T. Ezwa Mapiri, who makes the mountains, answered the giant. And who are you? I am Macoma, which signifies greater, answered he. Greater than who? asked the giant. Greater than you, answered Macoma. The giant gave a roar and rushed upon him. Macoma said nothing but swinging his great hammer, Nuendo, he struck the giant upon the head. He struck him so hard a blow that the giant shrank into quite a little man who fell upon his knees saying, You are indeed greater than I, O Macoma. Take me with you to be your slave. So Macoma picked him up and dropped him into the sack that he carried upon his back. He was greater than ever now, for all the giant's strength had gone into him, and he resumed his journey, carrying his burden with as little difficulty as an eagle might carry a hare. I hope you understand the significance of what we just said there. I will go over it at the end. Before long, he came to a country broken up with huge stones and immense clods of earth. Looking over one of the heaths, he saw a giant wrapped in dust, dragging out the very earth and hurling it in handfuls on either side of him. Who are you, cried Makoma, that pulls up the earth in this way? I am Chidubalataka, said he, and I am making the riverbeds. 
Do you know who I am? said Makoa. I am he that is called Greater. Greater than who? thundered the giant. Greater than you, answered Makoma. With a shout, Chi Dubalataka seized a great clod of earth and launched it at Makoma. But the hero had his sack held over his left arm, and the stones and earth fell harmlessly upon it. And, and the giant who was inside the bag. And tightly gripping his iron hammer, he rushed in and struck the giant to the ground. Chi Dublataka groveled before him, all the while growing smaller and smaller. And when he b had become a convenient size, Makoma picked him up and put him into the sack beside Chi Eswamapiri. He went on his way even greater than before, as all the river maker's power had become his. And at last he came to a forest of boababs and thorn trees. He was astonished at their size, for everyone was full grown and larger than any trees he had ever seen. And close by he saw Chi Guizamita, the giant who was planting the forest. Planting the forest, okay? Chi Guizamita was taller than either of his brothers, but Makoma was not afraid and called out to him, Who are you, O oh big one? I, said the giant, are Chi Guizamita. I am planting these boababs and thorns as food for my children, the elephants. Leave off, shouted the hero, for I am Makoma and would like to exchange a blow with thee. The giant, plucking up a monster boab by the roots, struck heavily at Makoma, but the hero sprang aside, and as the weapon sank deep into the soft earth, whirled Nuendo the hammer around his head and felled the giant with one blow. So terrible was the stroke that Chi Guizamita shriveled up as the other giants had done, and when he had got back his breath, he begged Makoma to take him as his servant. For, for, said he, it is honorable to serve a man so great as thou. You get the drift so far? Okay, you should be understanding this and what is really being said here. Real easy if you follow along with the research on his channel. Makoma, after placing him in his sack, proceeded upon his journey and traveling for many days. He at least reached a country so barren and rocky that not a single living thing grew upon it. Everywhere reigned grim desolation, and in the midst of this dead region he found a man eating fire. What are you doing? demanded Makoma. I am eating fire, answered the man, laughing, and my name is Chi Idi Moto, for I am the flame spirit, and can waste and destroy what I like. You are wrong, said Makoma, for I am Makoma, who is greater than you, and you cannot destroy me. The fire eater laughed again and blew a flame at Makoma, but the hero sprang behind a rock just in time, for the ground upon which he had been standing was turned to molten glass, like an overbaked pot, by the heat of the flame spirit's breath. Then the hero flung his iron hammer at the Chia Diamoto, and striking him, it knocked him helpless. So Makoma placed him in the sack, Waronawu, and the other great men, that he had overcome. Great men. Great men. Big men. Hmm. And now truly, Makomo was a very great hero, for he had the strength to make hills, the industry to lead rivers over dry waste, foresight and wisdom in planting trees, and the power of producing fire when he wished. Wandering on, he arrived one day at a great plain, well watered and full of game, and in the very middle of it, close to a large river, was a grassy spot, very pleasant to make a, a home upon. Makoma was so delighted with the little meadow that he sat down under a large tree and removed the sack, removing the sack from his shoulder, took out all the giants and set them before him. My friend, said he, I have traveled far and am weary. Is not this such a place as would suit a hero for his home? Let us then go tomorrow to bring in timber to make it a crawl. So the next day, Makoma and the giant set out to get poles to build the crawl, leaving only Chiz Chiezwa Mapiri to look after the place and cook some venison which they had killed. In the evening, when they returned, they found the giant helpless and tied to a tree by one enormous hair. How is it, said Makoma, astonished? that we find you thus bound and helpless. O chief, answered Chi Eswamapiri, at midday a man came out of the river. He was of immense, 
immense statue, and his gray mustaches were of such length that I could not see where they ended. He demanded of me, Who is thy master? And I answered, Macoma, the greatest of heroes. Then the man seized me, and pulling a hair from his mustache, tied me to this tree, even as you see me. Macoma was very wroth, but he said nothing, and drawing his fingernail across the hair, which is thick and strong as palm rope, cut it and set free the mountain maker. The three following days exactly the same thing happened, only each time with a different one of the party, and on the fourth day Macoma stayed in camp when the others went to cut poles, saying that he would see for himself what sort of man this was that lived in the river and whose mustaches were so long that they extended beyond men's sight. So when the giants had gone, he swept and tidied the camp and put some venison on the fire to roast. At midday, when the sun was right overhead, he heard a rumbling noise from the river, and looking up, he saw the head and shoulders of an enormous man emerging from it. And behold, right down the riverbed and up the riverbed, till they faded into the blue distance, stretched the giant's gray moustaches. Who are you, bellowed the giant, as soon as he was out of the water? I am he is called Macoma, answered the hero, and before I slay thee, tell me also what is thy name, and what thou dost in the river. My name is Chindubu Mogiri, said the giant. My home is in the river, for my mustache is the gray fever mist that hangs above the water, and with which I bind all those that come unto me so that they die. And some illustration there. Great illustrations. Remember that old book. You cannot bind me, shouted Macoma, rushing upon him and striking with his hammer. But the river giant was so slimy that the blow slid harmlessly off his green chest. And as Macoma stumbled and tried to regain his balance, the giant swung one of his long hairs around him and tripped him up. For a moment, Macoma was helpless, but remembering the power of the flame spirit which had entered into him, he breathed a fiery breath upon the giant's hair and cut himself free. As Chindabu Magiri leaned forward to seize him, the hero flung his sack, Waronawu, over the giant's slippery head, and gripping his iron hammer, struck him again. This time the blow alighted upon the dry sack, and Chindabu Magiri fell dead. Okay, this guy fell dead. He didn't keep him because he wasn't doing anything he needed there. But the other guys were important stuff. Okay, Macoma in the hands of Sekaterina. When the four giants returned at sunset with the poles, they rejoiced to find that Macoma had overcome the fever spirit, and they feasted on the roast venison till far into the night. But in the morning when they awoke, Macoma was already warming his hands to the fire, and his face was gloomy. In the darkness of the night, O oh my friends, he said presently, the white spirits of my fathers came upon me and spoke, saying, Get thee hence, Macoma, for thou shalt have no rest until thou hast found and fought with Sakaterina who has five heads, and is very great and strong, so to take leave of thy friends, for thou must go alone. Then the giants were very sad, and bewailed the loss of their hero. But Macoma comforted them, and gave back to each the gifts he had taken from them. Then bidding them farewell, he went on his way. Macoma traveled far towards the west over rough mountains and waterlogged morasses, folding deep rivers and tramping for days across dry deserts where most men would have died. Until at length he arrived at a hut standing near some large peaks, and inside the hut were two beautiful women. Greeting, said the hero, is this the country of Sakaterina, of five heads who I am seeking? We greet you, O great one, answered the women. We are the wives of Sakaterina. Your search is at an end, for there stands he whom you seek. And they pointed to what Macoma had thought were two tall mountain peaks. Those are his legs, they said. His body you cannot see, for it is hidden in the clouds. Macoma was astonished when he beheld how tall was the giant, but 
nothing daunted, he went forward until he reached one of the of Sacaterina's legs, which he struck heavily with Nuendo. Nothing happened, so he hit again and then again until presently he heard a tired, far, far away voice saying, Who is it that scratches my feet? And Makoma shouted as loud as he could, answering, It is I, Makoma, who is called Greater. And he listened, but there was no answer. Then Makoma collected all the dead brushwood and trees that he could find, and making an enormous pile around the giant's legs, set a light to it. This time the giant spoke. His voice was very terrible, for it was the rumble of thunder in the clouds. Who is it, he said, making that fire smolder around my feet? It is I, Makoma, shouted the hero, and I have come from far away to see thee, O Secretarini. For the spirits of my fathers bade me go seek and fight with thee, lest I should grow fat and weary of myself. There was silence for a while, and then the giant spoke softly. It is good, O Makoma, he said, for I too have grown weary. There is no man so great as I, therefore I am all alone. Guard thyself, and then... Bending suddenly, he seized the hero in his hands and dashed him upon the ground. And lo, instead of death, Makoma had found life, for he sprang to his feet mightier in strength and stature than before. And rushing in, he gripped the giant by the waist and wrestled with him. Similar to Brutus there in uh, Giants of Albion. There. And Gog Magog. Hour by hour they fought, and mountains rolled beneath their feet like pebbles in a flood. Now Makoma would break away, and summoning up his strength, strike the giant with Nuendo, his iron hammer. And Secretarina would pluck up the mountains and hurl them upon the hero, but neither one could slay the other. At last, upon the second day, they grappled so strongly that they could not break away, but their strength was failing, and just as the sun was sinking, they fell together on the ground, insensible. In the morning when they woke, Malimo, the great spirit, was standing by them, and he said, O Makoma and Sakadarina, ye are heroes so great that no man may come against you. Therefore you, ye will leave the world and take up your home with me in the clouds. And as he spake, the heroes became invisible to the people of the earth and were no more seen among them. The end. Okay, folks, so... Being long-time subscribers, if that's who you are, you should have interpreted this story correctly. And it seems clear as day that the story is, is that Makoma received all this knowledge from the giants. And it was imparted to him symbolically through these stories, okay? He got it by vanquishing these guys okay and then killing the one bad giant there from the river right so it seems to me that this is a combination in this story here of what went on in the past and what we've heard before in any other location where we've heard legends of the giants okay and they've combined it into one story here so you have the giant genocide and all the knowledge of the giants being assimilated by this great hero, Makoma, and how people became, you know, proficient at these various sorts of things were brought to them by the giants in this legend here, okay? So, real easy to see how this is, okay? You have all the things that the giants were doing Okay, the fire, they bring metallurgy, okay, you need, in order to do metallurgy, okay, you need the intense heat from coal fire, the kind of heat that's going to melt anything, melt stone, turn stone to glass, etc., etc., that's, you know, that don't happen with a regular fire, folks, you know, just, just you got to have extreme heat to, to cause all this melting to occur, you know, whether it be metal, glass, whatever. Okay, iron. Okay, obviously you know what kind of temperatures it takes. So, this is what the story is about. It's about the gifts they imparted upon, the giant's gifts imparted upon these people, told in his story, at the same time covering the giant genocide as well. Okay, it's a sort of combination story here. 
okay? They're building mountains, mounds. They're constructing rivers, canals, okay? They're building with stone, right? The one with the stone, throwing the stone around there, okay? So they're building with stone, designing canals, engineering canals, you know, building mounds, and of course that has to be done with engineered soils and other techniques to make them long lasting. And you're dealing with metallurgy here with the hot temperature of the fire by the one giant, the other giant there, and he kept them. He didn't, he didn't kill them, right? Because they gave them the gifts, okay? That's the part of the story, you just you gotta decipher it all, folks. And then he killed the giant there he had the giant battle with the one there, okay? So, you know, some of the giants were left, right? Not all of them were killed off, right? And that's how it was. And then they both went up with the great spirit there. And who's left? Just us homo sapiens left, right? Average size ones. Except for the places in the world where that giants survived, like the Watusi, the Frisians, the Fiji giants, and a few others here and there. And going, you know, just back into the recent past, there were even more, but, you know, they've been assimilated at this point. So, I hope you enjoyed that little legend there, guys. And then, of course, you know, if you're an expert, which you are from following along on the channel and all the research on the channel, okay, you know what the story's all about. Okay? And the symbolic meaning of Macomber, you know, coming into contact with all these different giants who had these skills that were imparted upon him through absorbing them, <laughs> right? They put him in his bag. He absorbed them into, like, you know, drinking Christ's blood and eating his body, which you're not doing, but you're, you know, you're consuming, you know, his words, okay? and his spirit, all right, same difference, okay, in told in story form, see, but now we know what the symbology actually means, right, so, I hope you enjoyed that little legend there from Africa there, I thought it was absolutely spot on, I mean, absolutely, right in line with everything we've heard about so far, just more affirmations about the giants and the giant humanoids of the past, what they were doing in all these areas, you know, what's, you know, came down from them, you know, they, they were the ones that, you know, were, <laughs> we claim responsibility for, you know, all these things we know about and really all we know came from this far ancient culture of the giants, of the giant humanoids, the large humanoids of the past. So, I hope you enjoyed that, folks. I'm going to continue looking into the Legends of the Giants because it just, you know, just continues to affirm everything we know about the Giants and this whole baloney story about them being cannibals and all that. We know exactly what that is because we're good researchers and scientists. We understand what the past is all about. We understand our own complexity and psychology and everything. So, you know, the real story about the giants in the past is how they gave us so much of their culture was passed down to us through various different kinds of societies, and even including if the Iroquois have anything to do with anything. I mean, that was incorporated directly into U.S. Constitution, you know, Bill of Rights and uh, Declaration of Independence. Everything's in there, you know, there's many things in there. It had to be acknowledged eventually by Congress. They had to have a special um, special um, note put in through Congress about that, okay, so all descended from the giants, okay, but never going to be admitted to, but we know what the story is, and just all these legends of the giants just affirm what the story is, so I hope you agree. And you should if you looked at all this material so far. So I don't think all these people who passed all this stuff on to us were cannibals and all that kind of stuff. So highly doubtful there. All right. And it just affirmed again and again and again. 
All right, guys, anyway, please do hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. And if you are not a subscriber, you should subscribe because you're going to hear about what the Giants really are and what the past is really about, okay? You go to the end of these other channels with sort of L.A. Marzulis and Coast to Coast and whatever mainstream garbage they got kicking around and you misinterpret everything. They don't even know what this story means. I just told you what it meant. And it's clear as day, that's what it is. We are far better anthropologists researching this subject than they are. They don't understand anything. Okay. So, please do subscribe if you're not a subscriber. And I will see you guys next week. I'm still recovering from the horrible, horrible variant here. And the good thing I got the DNA that I got. Some of the giants in here, I think, as a matter of fact from my father's side. Anyway, guys, Bugcat7 signing out. Peace.